Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our eighth night of our Bible journey. I'd like to thank you for making a choice to be here tonight as we discover more about the end time messages from Jesus. You see, last night we have discovered the, the right mode of baptism. We see that baptism by immersion was accepted and taught by our New Testament churches and also the apostles. We see that baptism is uh, baptism to the death of Christ and also in his resurrection. It means that we are entering a new gate of life where we will put on Christ and that represents our marriage to Christ. Last night I also encouraged us that we should bring someone along to come and discover more about the end time messages from Jesus and that tonight's message is about the mark of the beast. And I encourage everyone last night, please do come, because this is a very important topic for us to understand, because we have already discovered that those who will have the mark of the beast will suffer during the seven last plagues. And I believe we do not want to suffer that pain that will only be received by those who live in disobedience to the teachings and the commandments of God. Before we move any further, Please, I invite us all to bow our heads and let us offer a word of prayer. Heavenly Father in heaven, Lord, we need you tonight. We need your Holy Spirit, Lord, to lead us into all truths. We need you, Lord, to open our hearts, open our minds, Lord, so that we may know your will for us, so that we may know the end time messages, so that we could be prepared, Lord, for your soon return. Thank you very much, Lord, for this opportunity, this freedom of religion, this freedom of worship where we could come to worship you. Thank you very much, Lord, for being our God, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, what is the mark of the beast? Who is this beast? And what is this number mean, 666? So to know all of this, it is very important, because if we do not know, then we will have this mark. Therefore, we will suffer during the last seven plagues. So it is very important that we avoid it at all cost. A simple reading of the warning against the mark of the beast in Revelation 49. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, this angel represents a special message that will be proclaimed at a special time when the mark of the beast will be enforced just before the seven last plagues. Revelation 14.10, it says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here we see that those people who will receive the mark of the beast, they will suffer during the seven last plagues. And not only that, but they will also be in hellfire. It is mentioned, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, the lake of fire. Everyone should have this desire to study and understand this very important topic because for us to understand this we will know how to escape it and be safe and saved from the seven last plagues proverbs 22 3 we read a prudent man or a wise man foresees evil and hides himself but the simple pass on and are punished it is very important it is very important that we know the prophecies because it will make us wise and we can foresee the future we can foresee the future and the evil and therefore we hide ourselves taking refuge in the temple of the Lord but a simple man who does not care will just walk and accept any teachings of any man and therefore they will all be punished now we turn to the 13th chapter of Revelation where we will see the mark of the beast. You see in Revelation it uses symbolism. We already discussed that there are a lot of symbols that are used in Revelation 
and therefore it, is, it has a, a meaning. And all symbols have a key. I already mentioned that many people nowadays, they want to give its own meaning, therefore leading them astray from the true meaning. You see, the Bible gives the meaning of its symbols. It has what we call the golden keys that unlock the meaning of the symbols found in the book of Revelation or Daniel. In Revelation 13, 1, we read, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Notice, the first symbol is the beast. And the second symbol is the sea. I already explained about the sea, the symbol sea, in Revelation 17, 1. Revelation 17, 1, you will see the golden key about the sea. The sea represents people, multitude, nations. You see, that is the golden key of the symbol sea, found in Revelation 17, 1. But let us unlock the symbol, the beast. Let us continue to read. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. We found this prophecy in Daniel 7, the four great beasts that came out, out of the sea. First was the lion, then a bear, then a leopard, then a nondescript beast come came out of the sea or in other words came out of a group of people a nation a multitude of people here is an artist who draw this his conception of a beast described in revelation 13. you will notice that it is a composite of the lion the bear the leopard and the nondescript beast that is mentioned in daniel 7. now the question is what does a beast represents or means in Bible prophecy. So we turn to Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 23. Can we read together, 2, 3? So here is the golden key that unlocks the meaning of the symbol, the beast. So a beast represents a earthly power or an earthly kingdom. Now let us turn back to Revelation 13, 2, 5. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Here we find another symbol called the dragon. Notice the beast power was ready to reign for a specific period of time. Again, I mentioned already, sorry, I mentioned already in time, in Bible prophecy, time is also a symbol. It is symbolic. We do not take it literally. So here the time says for 42 months, for 42 months, but let us uh, consider each of these symbols separately. First, what is the symbol of the dragon? We can read in Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon is primarily the symbol of the devil or Satan. Secondly, we will discover that dragon is also a symbol of an agency which the devil, Satan, will use. You see, Satan will not come out in the open. He will be hiding in the background and using agency or organization or individual. Therefore, the dragon also symbolized an agency or an individual. So what agency will Satan use in the context of Revelation 12 and 13? We shall discover as we read Revelation 12, 3 to 5. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. You see, Bible scholars will all agree that this woman and man child represent none other than Virgin Mary. 
as she gave birth to the infant Jesus in Bethlehem's manger. But also, women or women in Bible prophecy represent a church. Let us keep that in mind. Now, through whom was Satan working his efforts to destroy the infant Jesus? You see, everybody knows about the story of, uh, on Christmas when the wise men from the east came to visit Jesus because they know of the prophecy. You see, someone who is not even a Jew knows about the coming of Jesus. But the Jews themselves who study the Bible did not even accept, expect Jesus to be born. So here we see wise men from the east coming to visit or see Jesus. They went first to King Herod and said, there will be a Messiah will be born. We come to visit him. Do you know where, where is he? King Herod said, oh, I do not know. Please, if you find this person, this baby, please do come back. Because the wise man said that this born baby will be the king of the Jews. That makes him angry. So he said, please, do come back and tell me where is this baby. But they went and they saw Jesus. But they never went back to King Herod. And the king was very angry. So what did he do? He, he sent out an order, a decree, that every child of two years and under to be killed, to be slain. You see, King Herod was a puppet king of a vassal state of the pagan Roman Empire. Actually, the authority he exercised was the authority of Rome. Therefore, again, I'm talking about the dragon symbolizing that Satan will work through an agency or organization or individual. So the dragon represents none other than the old Roman Empire under the rulership of the Caesars. Now let us return to the second verse and review it again, Revelation 13 to the dragon, pagan Rome, gave him the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. The capital of the Roman Empire is Rome. Naturally, the question comes, did Rome ever give to any other organization or earthly power its capital? Well, if we look through secular history, the answer will be yes. During the reign of Constantine the Great, the seat of Rome was to be transferred, was to be shifted. It was originally located at Italy, and then they have to shift it down to Turkey, what is called today Turkey. It was from Italy, so they shift the Roman Empire down to Turkey, leaving the Roman city, Rome city, vacant, empty. You see, one of the reasons they make this move is because it will strengthen the empire. I'm talking about the government, not talking about the church, I'm talking about the government. Constantine shift the government because he thought the shifting of the government will make his empire strong, leaving the Roman city capital empty, vacant. So, thus the city of Rome was vacated and turned over to the jurisdiction of the religious leaders who were presiding in Rome. Because Rome was empty, the empire has gone down to Turkey. They gave the power to the Roman religious system, the church. They gave the power to the church to take over the old Rome. So, from that time to the present, we see the Church of Rome inherited the city of Rome as the center or seat of its power and influence. So here is a picture of the Vatican, the world headquarters of the Roman religious system. The location that was given to the Emperor of Rome in direct fulfillment of Bible prophecy. To the succession of the Caesars came a succession of the pontiffs of Rome. Naturally, the question comes, are we sure that this beast represents papal system? Well, the answer is yes. There is additional proof to this. Let us continue reading. Revelation 13, 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Again, the time element, time in prophecy is symbolic. We already mentioned that time, one day is equal one year. 
We find it in Numbers 14.34, for each day, one year. So that is the golden key. You see, people want to make their own interpretation where when the Bible is giving the golden key. Again, Ezekiel 4, 6, I have laid on you a day for each year. So therefore, the time is mentioned here is 42 months. And if there is 30 days, we take 30 days for every month. So 42 times 30 is equal 1,260 days. Again, one day is equal to one year. So if it is 1,260 days, that means it is 1,260 literal years. Now, keep that in mind, the time, 1,260 years. Now, notice the prophecy. Said the dragon power, pagan Rome would give to the beast power. People Rome, it seat and power and great authority. So even though Constantine gave the city of Rome to the church, does not mean the church has the official religious supreme power yet. Okay? Until 538 AD. Until 538 AD, then the power has come to the Roman religious church. But not now, not yet. Because it says, as the Roman began to disintegrate, we study about the, the image in uh, Daniel 2. We study that all the empire coming down to the legs of iron, representing uh, empire Rome. And then separating into ten divisions. And we say that these ten divisions will mingle, but they will never be one. Because it says in the prophecy, they shall never adhere to one another. Okay? So, it is ten divisions. But then, these ten divisions here, these are ten divisions, we see three of these divisions are not going according to the Roman church system. So what did the Roman church did? They destroy these three. These are the Ostrogoths, Heruli, and Vandals. These three kingdoms, or ten, uh, these three divisions, they don't want to listen to the Roman religious system. Therefore, they were destroyed. War was made on these three. The last of the opposing power was Ostrogoth. This was the last power that was destroyed at the year 538 AD, according to prophecy. According to prophecy. Now, we add the 42 prophetic months, or 1260 literal years, to 538 AD. We will come to the year... 1798 AD. So the prophecy says time has been given, 42 months will be given for the beast to, to reign, to be in control, to be in power. But what will happen after these 42 prophetic months or 1260 years? After these 1260 years, what will happen? We studied about Napoleon. At the first night, we studied that Napoleon was a dictator who wants to be in control, who wants to put Europe back together and rule this one nation, to put them together as a nation and rule. But then Napoleon has a, a stumbling block. His stumbling block was the Pope. Because even though he'll become a leader, then it does, that does not matter. Because even though he becomes the leader, the Pope is still supreme. The people will still listen to the Pope rather than him. So this makes him angry. He doesn't want that to happen. So he sent a general, a general named Berthia, to go and capture Pope. And in the year 1798 AD, exactly on time, he commissioned one of his generals by the name of Berthia to march into the city of Rome and then abolish the papal government. Berthier captured the Pope and carried him away as a prisoner to exile. It is amazing that prophecy has been fulfilled. It happened exactly on time. Now, John saw that the beast was wounded. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. The whole world... The whole world thought that this was the end of the Roman religious system and that this move 
was the end of papacy. But however, we will discover later on in the series that this wound will be healed when we discover about the prophecy about United States. Now we proceed in additional uh, points of identification of the beast power. We read in Revelation 12 and 13 that this power would blasphemy, blasphemy and persecute during this 1260 year reign. Again, this 1260 year reign is called the Dark Ages. So the Roman religious system practiced blasphemy. And has it been persecuting people? First. What is blasphemy? You know, it does not matter what you think about blasphemy. It does not matter what I think about blasphemy. Let us turn to what the Bible says about blasphemy. We look in Luke 5.21, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this one who speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now Jesus was God in human form and had the power to forgive sins. But the religious leaders of his day considered him to be a mere man, and so they accused him of blasphemy. Now, blasphemy occurs when a mortal sinner claims the power and the position that belongs only to God. Okay, keep that in mind. Blasphemy is when a mortal sinner claims the power and position that belongs only to God. So the question comes, has the Roman religious system practice blasphemy from an official Roman publication we read there is a man on earth who can forgive sins that is the Catholic priest in another place we read the priest stands as a mediator between God and man we discover previous nights that who is our mediator Jesus in the most holy place but here we see that there is a man being a mediator then what's the use of Jesus? What's the use of Jesus in heaven being a mediator when there's a man claiming to be a mediator between God and man? So the question is, is this blasphemy? I think it is. On another occasion, the hypocrit hypocritical religious leaders of Christ, time accused him of blasphemy. We find that in John 10, 33, can we read 2, 3? Now, blasphemy. Our definition is a moral sinner claiming the position that belongs only to God. So, can we see, can we say that the priest is claiming the position of God? Well, remember, blasphemy is when a sinful moral man assumes the power that belongs and the position belongs only to God. Now, in the light of this biblical definition, of blasphemy is the Roman religious system guilty of this the Roman source the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh in the light of blasphemy is this blasphemy I think it is we read further from the Roman sources in 1335 Bishop Alvarez lays down the doctrine that as Christ partook the nature of God and man so the Pope is not simply a man but rather a God on earth it was against this boastful claims that like men like Martin Luther and others raised up their voices and protested against the church Thank God for the Reformation. It is very obvious that the beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10 is a religious power for it receives worship. Revelation 13, 4, 8 we read, And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, the book of life is mentioned here. Those names who is in the book of life will worship the God of heaven, who created the heavens and the earth. And then we see those names 
who are not written in the book of life, they are worshipping the image of the beast and the beast. So however, the papal system was more than a religious power. It was a political power as well. So it was a union of church and state. We discover uh, previous series, previous nights, that when these two comes together, church and state, what happened? Dark ages happened. Persecution happened. People being killed. That is, that's going to happen. Union of church and state, it will bring uh, all these religious leaders to superiority and power over civil rulers. This was made clear in Revelation 13, 7. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Therefore, during the 1260 years of papal supremacy, beginning in the 538 AD and ending in 1798 AD, the papal leaders ruled supreme. This was a time, 42 prophetic months, this was a time that the religious leaders, they ruled supremely. You see, if a king goes against these rulers, they will be excommunicated or disfellowshipped from the church. If they have been disfellowshipped from the church, they have already lost their power as a king. It doesn't matter if they are still a king, because the people will never listen to him. Because he has been excommunicated from the church. You see how powerful the church was? If you do not listen to the church, you will be excommunicated. Therefore, you have lost your power as a ruler. This happened to Henry IV of Germany. He found himself publicly disfavored with the Roman religious leaders and was excommunicated. It was not long after that he realized that he has also lost his power as a king. Even though to him, he recognized himself as a king, but to the people, the people do not look to him for rulership anymore, for he has been excommunicated by the church. So persecution is graphically portrayed in chapter 12 of Revelation. It pictures the church as a woman fleeing into the wilderness for protection. A woman in Bible prophecy, again, is a church. So the historian, Johann, writing in the 17th century said, the beast here described is the papacy. Ever since the times of the wildernesses, this has been confirmed by the blood of so many witnesses for the truth. It has been sustained at great cost by the Reformation. Even history affirms persecution by the Roman religious system during the Dark Ages. Note, Catholic, uh, from a Catholic uh, a historian Thomas said convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals because they were counterfeiters you see that you don't have to commit a crime even when you go against the church that is a big crime and you will be persecuted when we go against the church the Western watchman admits the church has persecuted only a tyro in church history will deny that. When she, the church, thinks it's good to use physical force, she will use it. You see, the church will use physical force if we do not listen to it. So the church was in a, a supreme, uh, supreme authority, leading the people, even the kings, bow down to the pope. If we were to visit this great library in Washington, D.C., and we open every history books, we will see that these papal system were killing people in the Dark Ages. And if we collected books that goes according to this prophecy, we will collect a ton and a half truck to carry them all. You see, it is easy to see that prophecy has been fulfilled down to the very last detail. Now let us consider a concluding point of the identification found in Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six, six, six. In the preceding verse of Revelation 13, 17, it speaks of a number of his name. Therefore, we shall study the name of the headman of this organization and determine whether or not 
the number of his name is 666. So, the letters on uh, the letters inscribed on the Pope's mitre are this, Vicarus Philidae, which in Latin means Vicar of the Son of God. So, we remember that in uh, Roman, Rome time they used Roman numbers, and Roman numbers are represented by letters of the alphabet. So let us consider the numerical value of these letters of the alphabet contained in the official title inscribed here. Vicarus Philidae. So the number, numerical value of each letter at the side, so V equals 5, I equals 1, C equals 100, A and R have no value, now I is equal 1, U and V doesn't have any value. U and V have a value of 5 together, same. S and F, S and F have no value. I1, L50, I1, I1, and D equals 500. E has no value. Again, I equals 1. So when you add them together, 112, 53, and 501, we come to the number mark of the beast, which is 666. Six, six. Again, this is not the mark of the beast. This is just identifying one of the identification of the beast. But it is not the mark of the beast. We will see that the mark of the beast, the Roman publication in the Roman publication we read, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So they're saying their mark, the mark is Sunday. And they're saying, we have authority. The church is above the Bible. So we have the authority to change the observance of Sabbath. Therefore, we have changed it from the seventh day Bible Sabbath to the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Again, now we find out the mark. 666, we discover later, it's just an identification of the beast. But now we have find out what is his mark. The stage was set for this back in the days of Constantine, when he, the emperor of Rome, became a Christian. So he became a Christian that because every time they're trying to, to kill and persecute the Christian, every time they do it, the more the Christian grows. So if you cannot defeat it, you join it. So once he joined the church, he asked his army, his army, he asked all of them to be baptized into Christianity. So he made them march into the river to be baptized. All of his army to be baptized in to become a Christian. So you see, he have come into Christianity. Not only that he came to Christianity, he also brought his teachings. Before he became a Christian, he was worshipping the sun. He worshipped the sun because to him the sun was a god. So he worshipped the sun god. And therefore, the church at that time, because they worship on the seventh day Bible Sabbath, they see every time they want to reach out to people, telling them, this is the true Sabbath of the Lord. But the people do not listen. So, how can you bring the people in? By changing the Sabbath. So, they change the Sabbath in uh, their meeting at Laodicea. The meeting at Laodicea at 336 A.D. They met the Council of Laodicea 336 AD and officially transferred the day of worship from the seventh to the first day of the week just to bring people inside the church. You see, they are above the Bible and they have the power, the authority to transfer the observance of the Sabbath just to bring pagan worshippers in and also the paganists bring in their teachings, therefore worshipping the sun god. This man says, it was the Catholic Church which changed the rest, the rest day to the Sunday. Then the observance of Sunday by Protestants is an, is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. You see, when we worship on Sunday, we are not worshiping the true God. But in other ways, we are worshiping the one who changed the Sabbath. We are paying homage to the Catholic Church. It is very, it is very 
um, difficult to understand because I already mentioned that in the last days, in the end time, there will be two groups of people, one who worship the, the heaven, God, God of heaven, and the mark of the beast. And we see here that worshiping on Sunday is not worshiping the true God, but rather paying homage to the Catholic Church. We are reminded in Exodus 20, 8, 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. See this word, remember. Let us remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because down through the ages, they have been convinced that Sunday is the true Sabbath. But in other ways, they are not worshiping the true God. They are paying homage to the one who changed the Sabbath, which is the Catholic Church. Friends, I'm not talking bad about the Catholic Church. I'm talking about the system, but not the church, not the people. There are good people in the Catholic Church, dear friends. Therefore, Jesus is calling out, come out of Babylon. He's calling out to the people to come out. There are some people in the Catholic Church that belongs to God. But we are talking about the system, how they run their church. You see, we are not worshipping God when we worship on Sunday, but rather we are worshipping the Catholic Church. We are paying homage to the Catholic Church. We continue, in it you shall not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see it says he rested on the seventh day, then it says he blessed the Sabbath day. Therefore the seventh day is the Sabbath day which has been blessed by the God of heaven. The president of this college, Father N. Wright, says, the Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. You see, dear friends, when we worship on Sunday, we are paying reverence to the Catholic Church. This is said by one of their, their, their leaders. Priest and Wright continue saying, I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by the Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep, and no one has called for the money. The question is, why hasn't anyone called for the money? Because the scripture, the Bible, does not support the changing of the Sabbath. Therefore, you cannot find it in the Bible. Therefore, nobody called the priest for $1,000. We read in a convert's catechism, question, which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, 336 AD, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Again, from the doctrinal catechism, we read, question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or precept teachings? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, or the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Let me just go back. It says here, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religion agree with her. You see, he's talking about all churches that has been worshiping on Sunday. So when they change the Sabbath from the seventh to the first, they're saying that all religion have agreed with them to worship on Sunday. So they have substituted the holy observance from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Dear friends, when we worship on Sunday, we are not worshiping the true God, but rather worshiping the mark 
of the beast or the image. Catholic Press of Sydney, Australia, we read, Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles from the beginning of, to the end of scripture. There is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week, which is the seventh, to the first. You see, we have allowed the papacy to tell us in their own words about the mark of their authority. Now let us return to Revelation 13, 16, which tells us how the mark will be enforced. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Dear friends, this word, causes, in other translation of the Bible, it says to force. You see, I don't know about you, I don't want to be forced. I don't want to be forced in doing something I do not want. But it says that he will force all, both small, great, rich, poor, free, slave to receive the mark of the beast. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see, they will stop people from going to go shopping or going traveling if we do not have the mark. And that will be a test of our faith. That will be a test of our faith. Remember, this time will happen before the door is closed. Probation will not be closed yet. This will happen. The enforcing of the Sunday law will happen before the closing of the doors. Because to test our faith. To test if we are true to the living God. If we will worship Him or worship the image. Dear friends, when that time comes... I believe we will, we will not, we will say no to the mark of the beast. Despite if we will be persecuted or if we will be put to prison, we will hold on to our faith. We may not be able to control the weather, but we are going to control the Congress in reference to the securing of Sunday laws. You see, right now, dear friends, in the Washington, D.C., the Congress is thinking of enforcing Sunday law. Defense. End of this month, the Pope will be visiting America, United States, and will be talking to the Congress. But this is mentioned a long time before this will happen. The Congress is already thinking of enforcing Sunday law, Sunday, Sunday observance, to worship on Sunday. But now the Pope will be going to talk to the Congress. We do not know what will be the subject about. But we do know that Sunday observance, Sunday enforcement is coming. Another advocate of Sunday legislation, a few years ago, it says, we propose to organize a Sunday rest league. Excuse me. Keep in front. We propose to organize a Sunday rest league and to erect a guillotine in the United States in view of which every politician will recognize that he is destined to be politically beheaded if he does not give us the legislation we demand. You see, they're saying that if those leaders will not accept what we want, they will be beheaded. Reminding us of the dark ages, the kings. You see, if you do not go according to what the church wants, you will be persecuted. It is coming again. It is coming again. When all of this will be enforced again. Dear friends, the end time messages is for us to be awakened. Let us stop sleeping. Things are happening. Come back to him while the door is still open. Another Sunday law proponent says we are laboring with all our might to carry the religious Sabbath Sunday with our right hand and the civil Sabbath with our left. 
Hundreds of thousands will receive it as a religious institution in the forehead. All the rest will receive it as a civil institution in the hand. And thus we will carry the whole nation. You see, dear friends, they are planning to enforce Sunday observance. They are planning to observe, to enforce it. Pressing for a national Sunday law, making reference to receiving it in their forehead and also in their hand. You see, these people, they're mentioning about receiving its mark on the forehead and also on the hand. And we, it comes from the prophecy that they will receive the mark on their forehead and on their hand. According to prophecies of Revelation, there will be two classes. The people who will worship God and the people who will worship the beast. Dear friends, which one of these classes we will be in? Which one will you serve? Which one will you stand up for? God says again in Exodus 20, 8 to 11, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Again, the question comes, how do we keep the Sabbath holy? We will answer it later. In it you shall not do any work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Listen to the promise. This is how we keep the Sabbath holy. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight in the Lord. Dear friends, how do we keep the Sabbath holy? By not doing things that pleases us. Rather, doing things or saying things that pleases the Lord. That's how we keep the Sabbath holy. And it says, And I will cause you to ride on the higher hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. He has promised, If we keep his Sabbath holy, he will bless us. He will bless us. Because Sabbath again is a sign between God and his people. My friends, we have everything to gain and nothing to lose when we follow Jesus. Our decision matters today. Do not leave it for a convenient time saying, I'll maybe next week or next year. You see many people nowadays, when the seventh day or Saturday comes, you see people town doing shopping, doing their own thing carelessly. But I do not blame them for they do not know. They do not know what they are doing until they have heard the message. And I believe many have heard and they have lived in ignorance. Dear friends, let us, let us not be like them. Because once the time comes, once the door closes, there is no more repenting. There is no returning. Because if God has shut down something, no one can open it. Dear friends, Sunday or Sabbath, which day will you worship? Which God will you worship? Let us make that decision today before it is too late. Now we look to those who observe the Sabbath. We see all of them, all of great people, of, all of God's great people throughout the ages, starting from Adam. They are God's people, starting from Adam till now. They are God's people who have been keeping his Sabbath, who have been keeping his teachings, who have been living in obedience to his words. Dear friends, let us not keep the doctrines of men or the teachings of man, for it will not save you. Let us follow Jesus. Let us follow him. Amen. He says to his disciples, follow me, and I will make you, and I will change you, and I will mold you to become fishes of men. Amen. Dear friends, we have heard that when we follow Jesus, we will put on Jesus, we will be in a new self. Not an old man, but a new self. Where everything we'll do will not be according to this world, but according to his will. Because we have discovered yesterday that many will call out, Lord, Lord. Not all of them will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only those who does the will of the Father. Amen. Dear friends, today is the day of salvation. Do not leave it. 
kill tomorrow. God will judge. Remember, we've discovered that right now there is a judgment going on. There is a judgment going on. Once your name has come up, the question is, will God stand up and represent you? Or he will reject your name? Dear friends, while we are still alive, while there is still breath in us, let us come to him before it is too late. Let us surrender ourselves. Let us surrender our all to him and let him lead us. For he is the way, the truth, and the life.
in the clouds of glory. I don't know, I don't know how you feel, but to me, I could not wait for that day, that glorious day, that only those who worship Him will inherit the kingdom of God. Dear friends, do not leave it till tomorrow. Surrender today. Today is the day of salvation. God wants you to worship Him. You are His children. You are His beloved creation. He loves you so much. Dear friends, today is the day of salvation. Let us surrender our all to the Lord. Lord, we surrender. We surrender our all to you. Lord, we surrender everything that you be in control in our lives. Lord, there are many things, Lord, that we have done that is not according to will. Lord, please forgive all of our unrighteousness. Lord, we really would like to be part of your kingdom. Lord, help us to prepare for that day. That glorious day, Lord. The day we will be all be reunited, Lord, in your kingdom. Lord, thank you very much, Lord, for those who have standing. That they will surrender everything, their ways, their life to you. That they will follow you, Lord, until you come again. Lord, thank you very much, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for the end time messages from Jesus. Warning us, Lord, that the time has come. The time is short. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our wonderful prayer. And may you answer our prayer according to your will. And may your will be done in our lives. For this is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, our King. And everybody say, Amen. Amen.